So this is one of those moments in the semester, and I think I alluded to this in the previous lecture, um, where we, in our timeline of American history, we kind of have to hit the fast forward button a little bit. You remember this being a thematic survey uh, where we can't cover everything we only have one semester. So we're going to kind of blow through um, the, what they call the early republic period, presidencies of George Washington and John Adams and Thomas Jefferson, uh, something that pundits were bringing up um, last month, and that's the first um, peaceful transfer of power from one political party to another when Thomas Jefferson is elected. And Jefferson was not a Federalist, he was a, uh, what they called back then a Democratic Republican of, of the Jeffersonian Republican Party. Uh, we're going to skip all of that. And the, the connection from the last lecture to this one is, okay, we talked about creating the American Republic, but in, in examining these episodes that are a part of what we call the War of 1812 and, and conflicts associated with that, we can ask ourselves, you know, who are the citizens? that republic. Whose republic is it? And by proxy, whose republic is it not? <clears throat> and we'll look specifically at the figures of Tecumseh and his brother Tenskwatawa. You don't have to write that name down yet. You'll see it in the outline. Uh, chiefs of the Shawnee tribe who will lead a resistance that will ultimately see them aligned with the British whom the United States goes to war with yet again in the War of 1812, which also will encompass a, con a conflict just to the west of where we are right now in modern-day Alabama involving the Creek Indians, which will have incredible implications for American history moving forward and will allow us to introduce the figure of Andy Jackson. First, though... <clears throat> How is it that the United States can achieve its independence from Great Britain in the 1780s and then find itself once again at war with the United Kingdom not 25 years later? To understand why this happens, we have to understand the European context, or in other words, what was going on in Europe at that time. So let me put it to you. Do you remember from uh, world history in high school, or do you have general knowledge of European history? What was happening in Europe in 1812? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So <clears throat> if this were world history class, after talking about the American Revolution, we could talk about a revolution that occurred in France. A much more radical revolution, partly because France had an absolute monarchy, not a constitutional monarchy. They were stuck in a much older order, in other words. And perhaps predictably, a revolution that, that got so radical, it got a little bit out of hand, and ultimately begets a military dictator who claims the title of emperor, whose name is Napoleon Bonaparte. Who not only rises to become emperor of France, but builds an army unlike the world had ever seen and sets about very nearly conquering the entire European continent. Why is this important in a U.S. history class? Because in 1812, that is what the British were concerned with, Napoleon, as you all put it in a word. Their primary focus is a war with Napoleon's France. How does this involve the United States? Well, if you recall, or I guess you won't recall because I didn't lecture about the war itself. Who was it that came to America's aid towards the end of the American Revolution and helped the Americans defeat Britain? France. France. <laughs> and though there have been great changes in France since that time, obviously, Britain is thinking these guys are old pals. What if America is 
helping out France and shipping war materials over to the French and doing business with them. And so the British Navy begins harassing American merchant ships crossing the Atlantic Ocean and in the Caribbean, stopping them and boarding them by force and accusing them, and not just uh, stopping these ships by force and, and going on board and inspecting, looking for war materials and generally harassing these American merchants, but also they start to point fingers at the crew on these ships and say, you, I know you, you're a deserter from His Majesty's Navy. You were in the Royal Navy for Britain and you quit and ran away and we're going to take you back. And what ends up happening is this is just a pretext. Uh, these, these, these are not uh, actual deserters from the British Royal Navy and if Britain eventually admits to that and just drops the pretext, what you're left with is they're engaging in impressment. Something that in centuries or decades before the British Royal Navy would do. They could take British subjects, merchant seamen, and say, we're at war, it's time of crisis. You are now pressed into the service. It's like a draft. Compulsory military service in the Navy in this case. But what's different here? These are not British subjects. America's an independent country now. It's not a colony of Britain anymore. These are American citizens, free and independent citizens of a separate nation being forced into the military service of another nation, which is, of course, if you're the United States, uh, embarrassing, humiliating on the international stage. Uh, direct betrayal of the fact that you had, in the words of Jefferson in the Declaration, assumed that separate and equal station among the powers of the earth. It's a tarnishing of your reputation, and if you wanted to maintain any honor, you would have to try to put a stop to this. Completely unacceptable. And there had been attempts to resolve this issue through diplomatic means, which had uh, heretofore failed. Thomas Jefferson, when he was president, tried to put an embargo or another boycott on British goods, and that didn't work. And so the issue falls into the lap of America's fourth president, none other than James Madison, author of the Virginia Plan that we looked at last time. What to do about impressment in this threat to America's honor and reputation abroad? In Congress at the time, there are a number of young members of Congress, particularly in the Senate, individuals that will be important in our next lecture after quiz two, like uh, Kentucky's Henry Clay and South Carolina's John Calhoun, who were eager to go to war over this and suggest that the only way to defend America's honor and reputation were to go to war with Britain to force them to cease in this behavior. There's something else going on. They know, the, the individuals that become known as war hawks, they know that there's uh, another reason to go to war with Britain, but uh, these war hawks, um, this name, to this day, if there's somebody in government or policy making who's eager to go to war over something, we call them hawkish. Harkening back to this day and time, but um, they understood that on the, the in the frontier areas. Remember, Britain still controls Canada. Canada had not joined in on the American Revolution and remains a British colony. So there are British officials and traders and whatnot there, who in the border regions around the Great Lakes which America has not quite yet settled fully, and are mostly populated by Indians, those British merchants are trading with those Indians across the border and notably giving them guns, which those Indians then use to kill Americans who encroach upon their territory. All of that to say, in the minds of the Warhawks, a war against Britain was a handy excuse to go to war with Britain's Indian allies in those frontier regions.
That makes sense? To go to war with Indians who are getting guns from British traders in the, what we now call Midwest, in like Michigan and what becomes Michigan, what becomes Ohio, and so on. Uh, they have enough clout to convince Madison to ask Congress for a declaration of war in 1812, and here we are. Look at that cartoon. Encapsulates the thinking of war hawks who thought about a war against Britain being a way to go to war with Indians who were trading with Britain or aligned with Britain. You've got uh, Native American warriors with guns that they got from the British who have killed an American and scalped him and are handing the scalp over to a British military official. Let's examine what the U.S. looks like in 1812 because it, it has grown substantially from the days, the early days of independence. First of all, remember the proclamation line of 1763? When uh, the Seven Years' War was over and the British put down Pontiac's Rebellion over here and they drew that line along the Appalachian Mountain line and said, you, set, you colonists can't settle over here and over here. We don't want more Indian wars. Leave that territory for now as an Indian reserve populated by uh, the Shawnee and the Ojibwe's and the Miami and Ohio's and down here in the Choctaw, Chickasaw, Cherokee, and Creek. Well, once you win the revolution, that line doesn't exist anymore. And you can then proceed to cross over the Appalachian Mountains, force Indians out, and begin to settle in these areas. There was some question as to how that process would play out. You'll recall that colonies like Virginia claimed land all the way to the Mississippi River. So would you simply extend the boundaries of the original 13 states? We know they didn't do that. There was some question that would you treat these areas to be colonized, areas to be colonized. You could establish in those areas colonies of the original 13 states. We know they didn't do that. You know the piece of legislation that establishes what they did do? It's called the Northwest Ordinance. And it says these will become initially territories quasi-states with a governor and a militia and a, you know, some semblance of uh, court structure and Indian agents to deal in trading and diplomacy with the Indians. And once we have enough people in them, they could appeal to become new states. And as you see right here, we already have three new states in Ohio, Kentucky, and Tennessee. And a few more territories in Indiana, Michigan, Illinois, which you'll note encompasses the land that would eventually become also the state of Wisconsin and parts of Minnesota. Down here we have the Mississippi Territory below Tennessee, which includes not only what would become the state of Mississippi, but Alabama as well. And those territories remain uh, largely populated by Native Americans. But look at this too. The French ended up re-obtaining French Louisiana west of the Mississippi River, which you can see we have a new state in the form of Louisiana, but also the Louisiana Territory encompasses all of the so-called Great Plains and what would eventually become the states of Nebraska and Kansas and Arkansas and parts of Texas and Oklahoma and Wyoming and Montana and so on. Big ass territory, which Napoleon sold to the United States when Jefferson was president for a bargain price because he was desperate for cash to fight his war and to, to fund his grand armée. This remains unsettled and would largely for a long time. Jefferson famously sends uh, Lewis and Clark out there on an expedition to sort of survey it and come back. Um, and that's about it for now. But this is a snapshot. What we're going to zero in on is right here. The Ohio country, the area between the Great Lakes and the Ohio River here, where you have the state of Ohio, but also this Indiana Territory right here. That's where the Shawnee are. It's the Shawnee homeland. And then we're going to venture down here into Mississippi Territory. 
country in the last 30 years or so, there have been a great population shift. What I mean by that is there are a lot more white Americans there than there were before when you had the proclamation line in place. And so someone like Tecumseh in his early life would have seen his people go from being the majority in the region to being outnumbered. He would have also seen over the years a number of land sessions. To note how that is spelled and the root word being seed, C-E-D-E. -E. When you seed something, you sign it away or sell it. In this case, we're talking about land. We're talking about Indian chiefs working with American Indian agents, that is, agents of the government of the United States, to sell away portions of their land. And you can see them in different colors here with the years, from the late 1700s up until the 1810s, bit by bit by bit. Why would they do this? Well, on the one hand, we, it's obvious why the United States would want this land. That's what white people have been doing in America since they got there, desiring always more and more and more land. Why, though, would Indian chiefs, be they Shawnee or otherwise, sign away land? To find the answer to this, we could look at a letter that Jefferson wrote when he was president to the then governor of the Indiana Territory, William Henry Harris governor of the Indiana Territory, receives a letter from then-President Thomas Jefferson in which Jefferson lays out the sort of unofficial Indian policy for the United States in that region at that time. He tells Harrison, look, have your Indian agents go to these people, the Shawnee and others, and tell them, uh, we got whatever you need. Manufactured goods that you want for trade, we got you covered. Maybe not guns, but everything else. We'll find out what you want and we'll supply it and you'll give us the deer skins. Fur trade. And Jefferson tells Harrison, we know what's going to happen is eventually the deer population is going to start dwindling. The Indians are going to want more and more and more of these manufactured goods and we're going to sit down, our Indian agents and these American government officials are going to sit down with these chiefs at the end of the year and say, Look at the ledger sheet, Chief so-and-so. We provided you with this amount of value in manufactured goods. You gave us only this amount of value in furs. You got a trade imbalance on your hands, man. In other words, you owe us. You owe us money. And what, of course, is the only other thing of value that the United States wants from these Indians other than furs? Land, right? So the land sessions are to pay debts because of this trade imbalance that the Indians have with the United States government. And Jefferson laid all of that out on paper before it happened. Not as happenstance, but as actual official policy. This was the entire point all along. Tecumseh knows that. He's come to realize that in his own lifetime. A lifetime in which he had seen more and more and more white people come into his homeland. He had fought, as had his brothers and father, with the British during the American Revolution. And so think about that. When we talk about the War Hawks and knowing that a war against Britain was a war against Britain's Indian allies, we didn't just mean people the British were trading with. We mean people that the U.S. government remembers had fought with the British in the American Revolutionary War. And that includes Tecumseh, who had seen family members die in that war. And who had indeed traded for guns with British traders and used them to shoot at and kill Americans encroaching upon his lands. And Tecumseh is a great opponent of these land sessions. For him... A revival of Indian culture, of Shawnee culture, would see these land sessions as abhorrent, as terrible, in other words, 
not only in that you're selling away your ancestral hunting lands, but even in the very concept that land was something that could be bought and sold to begin with. Tecumseh would say that, that the land is no different from the air and this, the water and the sea. It's not something to be parceled out and bought and sold. It's to be shared among our people. And I should note that the Shawnee were not like, say, the Powhatan or the Wampanoag, where they had one single paramount chief. It's more diffuse, and they have multiple chiefs with authority that shared authority. And so you could have two or three chiefs sign away with a treaty with America, some huge parcel of land, and these chiefs over here, which might include Tecumseh, are like, who gave you the right? And that was our shared and collective hunting land. What gives you the right to sell that away? So these land sessions have divided up the Shawnee among themselves. Which is also on top of the fact that the Shawnee are, of course, not the only Native Americans in that region. There's the Sac and Fox and the Miamis and so on. And if you're the U.S. government, you want to keep the Native Americans divided. And Tecumseh also knows that. And then finally here... He's also aware that the policy of the U.S. government through its Indian agents is to promote something called the U.S. Plan of Civilization. A concerted effort to get Native Americans to abandon Native American culture and social values and mores and to adopt white Anglo-American culture and so, uh, social values and norms and mores. For example, they wanted to encourage the idea of the individual ownership of land, to move away from villages with communal farms to having family farmsteads in which lived a nuclear family of husband, wife, and children, in which the wife was a homemaker and did spinning and weaving in the home. And the husband worked out in the fields and grew crops and raised livestock like cattle and pigs. and to move away from the matrilineal, communal way of living that most Native Americans had embraced for generations. Um, notable among this, you're asking Native Americans to engage in a complete gender role reversal. You may recall uh, in most Native American societies, women did the farming. So you're asking men to do women's work. You'll also recall that raising livestock is not something that Native, most Native American societies did. Spinning and weaving was not something that typically women did, and so on. Many were hunters, right? And you're also simultaneously engaged in asking them to hunt, to hunt, to hunt, to the point of dwindling the deer population, and so on. Tecumseh then, of course, is a great opponent of this U.S. plan of, uh, plan of civilization. He seeks to reverse the fragmentation of the Shawnee and dividing Indians against other Indians and to build a pan-Indian confederacy. When you see pan like that, that means united. So Tecumseh's mission is to unite Native Americans in the frontier areas uh, and not just in the Ohio country perhaps as far south as the Mississippi Territory, where the creeks are, as we'll see, as far north as British Canada. The thinking being that by themselves, somebody like the Shawnee were not powerful enough or large enough in number to stand up to America, but united Native Americans were. It would take the one single charismatic leader to bring them together, and Tecumseh was suited for that role. He's a great recruiter, if you will. His brother is named Tenskwatawa. Like many Indians, he had taken to alcohol upon being introduced to it, become a drunk. But he sobers up, if you will, and has an epiphany and a vision of the Shawnee master of life or God who tells him that if he and his brother could unite Native American peoples they could destroy the children of the evil serpent, which is to say, white people. And they could have a return to, as Tecumseh would say, the old ways. A revival of Shawnee and more broadly Native American culture. 
and to reverse the ill effects of this U.S. plan of civilization and to get that land that was ceded back. He becomes known as the Shawnee prophet, does Tenskwatawa. And he provides a sort of religious complement to his brother's political message of uniting across lines of Indian nations or tribes. William Henry Harrison is still the governor of Indiana Territory at this time. He knows who Tecumseh is, he knows who his brother is and what they are doing. And as you know, going back to the previous presidency of Jefferson, Harrison was instructed to keep the Indians divided in addition to securing those trade imbalances and treaties with land sessions. So Tecumseh is very much on his radar and Harrison takes notice when Tecumseh leaves the region to travel south into uh, Creek country to recruit the Creeks to his Pan-Indian Confederacy. Harrison takes this opportunity to attack Tecumseh's people, uh, Tecumseh's people temporarily assembled at a Prophet's Town, thus named because of the temporary leadership of Tenskwatawa while his brother was gone. The ensuing battle of Tippecanoe is the beginning of this phase of the War of 1812 in which America is making war on Britain's Indian allies in this region. Questions? Tecumseh will rush back. He and his people in this early Pan-Indian Confederacy will uh, move up into British Canada to link up with British forces and continue to fight the war therein. But Britain doesn't just fight the war in Canada, and the war actually would extend into Creek country as well. What Tecumseh found when he moved into Creek country is that a lot of the young Creek warriors felt exactly the same way he did in rejecting land sessions, rejecting the U.S. plan of civilization, reviving the old ways, uniting to counter American encroachment, and so on. There was an entire faction of the Creeks known as the Red Stick Faction who felt precisely as he did. And who were very angry at another faction of the Creeks, the White Creeks, or the collaborating Creeks, who had actually worked with Indian agents in the territory and taken up the U.S. plan of civilization. Not only was this disgusting to the young Creek warriors in terms of having seen their ancestral hunting lands sold away and these among their own people collaborating with the American government and its agents, but also, too, that some of the collaborating Creeks had gotten very wealthy in the process. That individual right there, whose very dress would insinuate a blending of Creek and American culture, his name is William McIntosh. That's not a Creek name, if you're wondering. It's a Scottish name because his father was a Scottish-British trader who had married a Creek woman. And he chose to remain with his mother, which makes sense because Crete, like other Native American societies, was matrilineal. But he takes up the plan of civilization, builds a ranch, starts raising livestock and growing crops and so on, and becomes quite wealthy. It's people like that that the Red Sticks hate. And Creek country was on the verge of an internal civil war when Tecumseh arrives encourages the Red Sticks in, what's, in what they're doing, suggests that they could uh, join in with his Pan-Indian Confederacy. So they're emboldened by Tecumseh's visit, but Tecumseh has to run and go home because his brother's attacked at Prophet's Town by William Henry Harrison and the territorial militia of Indiana. So the Red Sticks are left to sort things out for themselves. Now remember, who do people like Tecumseh and the Shawnee, where did they get their guns? 
than the British traders in Canada? Well, the Creeks don't have that option. So where might they turn? Florida at that time, which included, if we're talking West Florida, all the way down here to what would later become Alabama, where Mobile is, and also to the city of Pensacola. So they actually set out, a detachment of them sets out south to go to Pensacola to see if they could trade with the Spanish for guns. The governor of the Mississippi Territory becomes aware of this, and the territorial militia attack these young red stick warriors at Burnt Corn Creek here. In retaliation for that, the red stick warriors turn and attack Fort Mims here along the Alabama River, where there was a detachment of collaborating creeks and also turned out some Americans. So the events at Fort Mims give the United States government all the excuse that they need to reinforce the Mississippi Territorial Militia with militia from the state of Tennessee and the regular U.S. Army or elements thereof under the leadership of Andrew Jackson. And what had been just a brewing internal civil war among the Creeks has now become an American war against the Red Stick faction. So Jackson and his troops will fight alongside the white or collaborating Creeks against the Red Sticks, which, if it seems like a mismatch, it was. But remarkably, the Red Sticks hold their own for a while until the decisive battle that takes place at Horseshoe Bend, where the Red Sticks have built a town that they call Tohopega. That's a name you don't have to write down, but the ruins of which would be right here in this uh, bend in the river, which they thought would provide, um, that's the Tallapoosa River, they thought would provide a sort of natural defensive barrier and that you could just fortify the top of the horseshoe here and you'd have a nice defensive location. Uh, what they did not count on is that Jackson, in building his force, uh, had recruited the Cherokee, who were longtime enemies of the Creeks and resided in the mountains and foothills of like North Georgia, Northeast Alabama, Eastern Tennessee. He had recruited the Cherokee and paid them money to come and fight with him, and he was able to take all of his combined force of two territorial militias and elements of the regular U.S. Army and attack the fortification and station the Cherokee alongside the other banks of the river so that when they overran Tohopeka and forced the Red Sticks across the river in a retreat, they get mowed down by the Cherokee and massacred. Horseshoe Bend is a decisive battle, ending this phase of War of 1812 and results in the signing of the Treaty of Fort Jackson. I thought I had a map of Creek land sessions, but I do not. There we go. So, if you go back to the 18th century or the 1700s. So the heartland of Creek country is here along the uh, Coosa and the Tallapoosa rivers that eventually come together to form the Alabama River. That's their homeland, but all of this, the majority of what becomes the state of Georgia were the ancestral Creek hunting lands, where there weren't a lot of Creek towns, but that's where they would go for months at a time and hunt during the season. Uh, or very early on, this was seeded and becomes the original part of the state of Georgia. But eventually, too, they sign away their land to uh, all the way to the um, Ogmulgee River, which flows through Macon. And then they cede their land all the way to the Flint River, which is here. And then the tree of Fort Jackson, they have to, Jackson forces them, and this is the collaborating Creeks that had been allies that Jackson had been fighting with against the Red Sticks, who were simply vanquished. He says, we solved your pesky problem and defeated your uprising for you. 
you owe us, and what you're going to do is you're going to sign away all of this. And that leaves them with only that. So the Treaty of Fort Jackson results in the signing away of all of this land. It's a betrayal in the minds of the collaborating Creeks who had done everything the American government had asked them to do up to that point. The problem is that Andrew Jackson doesn't think that Native Americans are equal human beings with white people. He's a racist, in other words, and a slaveholder, by the way. And he felt like the plan of civilization was a hopeless venture. That you would never, and then the, the Red Stick Uprising proved that, that you would never truly, quote unquote, civilize Native Americans, which is a way of saying, make them like us, socially and culturally. Well, haven't said anything about the actual war against Britain yet. Early stages of the war saw the United States invade British Canada to actually make some territorial gains and to begin to, in fact, state their claim to have conquered or overtaken parts of southeastern Canada. You can see kind of two theaters there. Uh, the U.S. attempts to take the cities of Montreal and Quebec up here. And then down here, where eventually would be the city of Toronto, that's where Tecumseh and his people end up fighting with the British against the United States down here. But that's not all. The British at one point decide to invade the Chesapeake region, which they do. The British Navy goes up into Chesapeake Bay. Their goal is, of course, to take the brand new U.S. capital of Washington, D.C. I mentioned Hamilton in here last time. How many of you have seen it? Okay, I'm not going to mention Hamilton anymore. All right, literally one person. All right. Uh, there's a scene in there, though, um, where Leslie Odom, who plays Aaron Burr, is like jealous because he's not in the quote room where it happened, which is there's been a, a backroom deal, so to speak, between um, Alexander Hamilton, who really wanted to, this is tertiary. He really wanted to establish a, a central bank of the United States, and does, because he got his enemies, Thomas Jefferson and James Madison, to go along with him. But the deal they cut with him is that the, they, they were going to design and build from scratch a brand new U.S. capital, which had bounced around between Philadelphia and New York. Jefferson and Madison, remember, where are those two from? Virginia. Virginia. And so they got Hamilton to agree to back locating the new capital right on the border of Virginia to kind of shift the seat of power, if you will, literally in this case, to the south. And so Washington, D.C. had just been designed by the French designer L'Enfant and had just been built, including the White House, and the British invade it and burn it down. James Madison and his family have to literally run out of the White House as British troops are entering the city. Uh, it was not, though, the goal of the British to occupy the American capital. They continued on, and if you know your geography, if they head north towards Philadelphia and Washington, D.C., the next big city that they would encounter is Baltimore, where the U.S. has kind of gotten its shit together and is able to attempt an, a, a defense of Baltimore, which would include the fort at the mouth of uh, Baltimore Harbor, Fort McHenry, protecting Baltimore Harbor from the British Navy, in addition to American troops trying to defend the city on land from the British forces that had just burned the city of Washington. This is the moment at which a, an American prisoner of war in a British ship out on the harbor looks out of the porthole of the ship in the night and sees we have exploding shells for the first time in warfare, so he sees the rockets red glare and the uh, bombs bursting in air. And uh, when the battle is over in the morning, uh, there the star-spangled banner yet waves, for America has won the battle. And Francis Scott Key writes a poem about it that's later set to music, which becomes a national anthem. So you have a shift of fortune for the United States here in winning the Battle of Baltimore. 
Britain responds by doing what they did essentially in the American Revolution, which they might have learned, I guess, but by taking the war to the south, the fleet sails into the Gulf of Mexico and invades Louisiana with an attempt to take the city of New Orleans in the mouth of the Mississippi River. Now think about where that is, and who is sitting idly nearby with a rather large and lately victorious military force at his disposal? Say it again. Jackson. Jackson, Jackson, absolutely. Jackson has just orchestrated the signing of the Treaty of Fort Jackson. He has not yet departed the region, and so it's nothing to divert Jackson and his forces slightly to the south to defend the city of New Orleans, which he does. The U.S. in one of the largest battles of the war goes toe-to-toe -to -toe with the mighty British Army in a traditional field battle and wins, which some began to celebrate as the culmination of a second war of independence even. Beat the British again. The great irony, does anybody know the great irony of this battle? The war was over. The treaty had already been signed. Problem is, it was signed in Ghent, which is in Belgium, which is on the other side of the Atlantic Ocean. Word had not yet arrived either to Jackson or his British counterparts, so they had no idea the treaty had been signed and the war was over, and they fight the battle for no reason. <laughs> so what's significant about it is it might not have and need not have taken place, but nonetheless it does, and it only contributes to a growing fame for Andy Jackson. He becomes legendary in his own time. As a man who not only was a great slayer of Indians in a time of great racism against Indians, but also a man who went toe-to-toe -to -toe with Britain and won. What's significant about the treaty itself? Well, for the most part, it restored what we call the status quo antebellum. Antebellum means before the war. Status quo means the way it was. Only in this case, the war against Napoleon is over. He has been defeated. The British don't have to worry about America supplying France anymore, and so impressment becomes a moot point. So the British, it's nothing for them in the treaty to say, okay, we won't engage in impressment anymore. We'll stop harassing American ships. By the way, could you, America, also please renounce your claims to Canada and remove your troops? America says, sure. America says to Britain, could you also please stop selling guns to the Shawnee and other people? And they say, okay. Tecumseh has been killed, by the way, in the fighting. His brother's prophecy had clearly not come true, and so he has been discredited. Native Americans had been deprived of that one single charismatic leader who might unite them across national and tribal lines. The red sticks are vanquished. The white collaborating Creeks betrayed and swindled out of much of their land. And so Native Americans are clearly the big losers in all of this. And perhaps the greatest winner of all is Jackson himself. The first um, U.S. president that we might describe as being highly improbable to have become president. All presidents up to that point had been aristocrats. Hell, most of them had been Virginia tobacco planters. But even John Adams was a wealthy and influential attorney, as you know. But how is it that Jackson rose to that level of political success? Well, he almost invented politics as we know it in the first place. But it was at first his military career. But before that, just a few words about Jackson's early life. Uh, his parents were Scots-Irish immigrants. Remember we talked about a large portion of immigrants into the colonies in the 18th century were Scots-Irish from Northern Ireland, but Protestant. Uh, they end up in what was then the territory of Tennessee just before the Revolution. Jackson actually gets taken prisoner by the British during the Revolution as a very young man, boy, really. 
But after the revolution, when Tennessee becomes a state, uh, he worked as a tradesman, a saddle maker for a while. He teaches himself law and becomes a lawyer, a prominent one at that, working at a time where land disputes were common, and that would be a matter that necessitated the use of lawyers. Obviously becomes an officer in the Tennessee State Militia, rising to the rank of general, leading those troops into Mississippi Territory, defeating the Red Stick Creeks. Now, when the war of, eight, of defending America and, and the city of New Orleans and the famed Battle of New Orleans, and when the War of 1812 was over, America shifts its focus in terms of Indian problems, if you will, to Florida. We just looked at how Spain controlled Florida, and I use that word control very loosely, because as I've talked about in here before, uh, I think, didn't I talk about the Stono Rebellion? And how those slaves that engaged in the rebellion had attempted to escape into Spanish Florida because there were maroon communities. The interior of Florida was not controlled by Spain. It was Indian country. And those Indians would welcome runaway slaves from America. And the U.S. government knew that. And Spain wasn't doing anything about it. And America gambled that they also wouldn't do anything about it if America sent its own troops in there to fight these Indian Maroons who were encouraging slaves in America to run away. And of course, who do they put in charge of doing that? Jackson. And he fights a series of conflicts that become, or some of them, he's uh, fighting in, that become known as the Seminole Wars. The Seminoles of Florida were refugee creeks. The great Seminole leader, Osceola, is from Tallahassee, Alabama. Seminole, or Creeks who had migrated from their homeland south into Spanish Florida and were among those who would welcome runaway slaves into that territory. And the U.S. government sends its army in there to fight them, despite the fact that it was a Spanish territory at the time. Which, of course, the U.S. would eventually just simply acquire from the Spanish. My point is that this only increases the fame and reputation of Jackson. And when he retires from military duties, he decides to enter the political realms and founds a political party that he calls the Democracy. This is separate from Jefferson's Repub Democratic Republican Party. This, part, this party simply becomes known as uh, the Democratic Party. Among its founding principles for the concept of universal suffrage. What's suffrage? Not like suffering. Right. Right, right to vote. vote. Yeah. Suffrage franchise, sometimes called, is a right to vote. At that time, most states had restrictions on the right to vote uh, that included property ownership of a certain amount. So uh, you had to own a certain amount of property to be able to vote. Jackson advocates doing away with those kinds of restrictions, but when I say universal suffrage, why do I have WM in parentheses there? Mm -hmm. That they would be excluded from this. Mm -hmm. And who else would be excluded from the right to vote under Jackson's place? Slaves. Slaves, certainly. Free black people, too. Mm -hmm. Indians, certainly, which he viewed as inferior. So WM means mm -hmm. white male. White male. Universal white male suffrage is what he advocates. The ability of the right of all white men to be able to vote. Also, the party claims to be the party of states' rights. They inherit from the Jeffersonian Republicans and from the Anti-Federalists the tradition of favoring more state power over central or federal power. As part of that stance, Jackson uh, denounces very much Hamilton's brainchild, the Bank of the United States, that Jefferson and Madison had opposed until Hamilton agreed to putting the capital in Washington but to support that. He would seek to destroy the Bank of the U.S., which he sees as the instrument 
of enrichment for an elite select wealthy few to the detriment of the average American farmer. He inherits from Jefferson this idea that the essence of America is what he called the yeoman farmer, the average, not poor, but not fabulously, ostentatiously wealthy plantation owner, but just your average American farmer. That's the essence of the American Republic, supposedly. What's the big difference, though, between Thomas Jefferson and Andrew Jackson in claiming to be the the leader who champions the rights of the common white man. Well, Andrew Jackson actually at one point was the common white man. He's born poor, essentially, and rises in wealth and fame and becomes, yes, a slave owner. Thomas Jefferson was born into a family that was already fabulously wealthy. So when he claimed to be the champion of the common man, you know, there was at least this little bit of irony to that, that he had never been the common man. Jackson was the first to become president who had indeed come up from nothing. Among the founding planks of the Democratic Party, too, finally here, was a plan to, quote, clear and settle the interior. To clear and settle the interior. By the interior, they meant the land between the Appalachian Mountains and the Mississippi River. By clear it, what do they mean? I don't mean clear it of trees, although that might be part of it if you're building farms and plantations. Indians. Clear it of Indians, get them out, and settle it with white people. To put that another way, this would be a plan of Indian removal from what back then were known as the Old Northwest and Southwest. Well, Jackson eventually gets elected president. His party rises to an ascendancy. He serves two terms, as you can see there, spanning 29 and 37. And much of his program is achieved. They do destroy the Bank of the United States. America wouldn't have another central bank until the 20th century the creation of our current Fed, or Federal Reserve. The state's rights plank was interesting uh, because Jackson essentially has to do the exact opposite of that at one point. Um, this is tangential since it's not on the PowerPoint, but I'll say it anyway since we have some time. At one point, the Congress passes a, a law which establishes um, a massive tariff on the importation of certain manufactured goods. It was thought to be protectionary. That is, if you tax like British and other countries' manufactured goods, people would buy American because it would cost less. But if you were from a state that was involved in more agriculture and you depended upon like exporting your tobacco and rice and whatnot, your fear was that, one, that would drive up the cost of all manufactured goods across the board, and two, other nations might retaliate by putting taxes on your rice or your tobacco. In other words, uh, members of Congress from the South and state officials from the South are very much opponents of that tariff. South Carolina claims it's null and void and has no authority there because they've nullified it threatens even to secede from the American Union, prompting Jackson to threaten them with a military invasion. So Mr. State's rights at one point had to threaten one of the states with extreme federal power because of this so-called tariff of abominations. Now finally then, Indian removal, which Jackson and Democrats in Congress will achieve with the passage in the early 1830s of the Indian Removal Act. Directing that the so-called five civilized tribes of the then Southwest be either voluntarily or forcibly removed to a brand new territory carved out of the Louisiana Purchase to be known as Oklahoma, which would serve as an Indian reservation for the Choctaw and the Chickasaw, the Cherokee, the Creek, and the Seminole. There is, of course, resistance. 
resistance among some of the Cretans. If they didn't feel betrayed before, they sure as hell did now. And just to pause that for a second, think about the irony here. They call them the civilized tribes, meaning these people had done everything the U.S. government had asked them to do. And that includes the Cherokee, who made this case remarkably, not on the field of battle, but in court. They bring, bring a suit in federal court to stop this, which makes its way all the way up to the U.S. Supreme Court, in which they argue we have engaged with the U.S. plan of civilization. We have taken that up. We have taken up your ways. We have assimilated. We have, they, they would say we have an English language newspaper. We have a constitution now that we modeled on your own, for God's sake. What more do we have to do? And they argued in there, we have been recognized by this government going back to George Washington's administration as a separate nation. You cannot do this to us. And the Supreme Court agreed with them and sided them in their favor. Thank, is that me? Wow, that is abysmal. I never have that on. Man, that's embarrassing. Um, and captured on film. Famously, Jackson, and this may be apocryphal, like maybe never actually said it, but says something to the effect of, well, the Chief Justice has made his ruling. Now let's see him enforce it. Meaning, what the hell is the Supreme Court going to do about it? And we see this in a few times throughout American history. If the U.S. Supreme Court makes a ruling and neither the President nor Congress wants to enforce it, it might well go unenforced, and such was the case here. And the Cherokee get forced out of their homes and villages by the U.S. Army and forcibly marked hundreds of miles through snow and ice in Kentucky and Illinois and through Missouri, the so-called Trail of Tears, during which many of the Cherokee people died. An event which would live on through generations of the Cherokee even to today as a sort of seminal event. And their relocation to lands they had been promised would be of equal uh, value and quality and size in Oklahoma that of course were not. Choctaw and Chickasaw removed in much the same way. The Seminole keep fighting and retreating farther and farther south into the swamps of South Florida, long before those swamps were drained to create the city of Miami did not exist. What are the consequences of Indian removal? Well, let's think about that. The top, those two maps represent 1820. The bottom, those two maps represent 18, excuse me, um, the left, those two maps represent 1820. On the right, those two represent 1860. Top represents the slave population in the, this area of the United States. In 1820, that's concentrated in a couple of places, the low country, the rice producing region, and the Chesapeake, the tobacco producing region, which by the way, uh, the tobacco market had all but collapsed and um, Planters there were seeking ways to get rid of slaves just to stay afloat, looking for new crops to grow that might serve as valuable exports, and so on. Here is cotton production, which was almost non-existent in 1820. We'll look at 1860. After Indians had been removed from this area, this is a, this is a, I would say this is a little off. This should be more like down here. And extend up through here. The slave population there has exploded as it has down here in the Mississippi uh, Delta region as well and should also include up here. Cotton production in those same areas has also exploded for four factors converged to give rise to the cotton kingdom. One was obviously Indian removal and opening up this area for settlement and the emergence of an incredibly vast domestic slave trade where at slave markets all throughout this region 
Slave owners from the old tobacco growing and rice growing regions sell tens of thousands of slaves to white people who move into this territory and would use those slaves to grow cotton for the cotton gin had been invented, allowing for ease of separation of cotton fiber from seed and stem. And someone had realized that this region and its dark, rich black soil from which we get the name the Black Belt, right below where we sit, stretching into Alabama and Mississippi, was perfect for growing what they call long staple cotton. And then finally, the beginnings of the Industrial Revolution in Britain and the emergence of textile mills provided the economic demand for cotton that would allow people to export this stuff and for cotton to replace rice as America's most valuable export. And of course, still though, slaves remain its most valuable commodity. So the point here is, Jackson's commitment to Indian removal is not only tragic in terms of the consequences for the so-called five civilized tribes, it also allows for an unprecedented growth in American slavery. I should have mentioned before, that Northwest Ordinance that kind of laid out how the, what we now call Midwest would become new states, it included a ban on slavery that would maintain the north-south divide where the northern states had abolished slavery because it hadn't been so important to their economy. They didn't want to have to worry about a slave revolt. And to the south where slavery was legal. Well, it's a mirror image. Slavery was abolished in the northeast and banned from the northwest. Well, it existed in the south and it gets to move into the deep south. This will set up after quiz two the question in the sectionalism lecture of can slavery continue to expand into the West, at least in the southern portion of the United States? This was put together by historians of Georgia, and it shows you piece by piece land sessions from Native Americans and the emergence of um, Indian reservations. It says, between 1776 and 1887, the United States seized over 1.5 billion acres from America's indigenous people by treaty and executive order. Explore in this interactive map how every Native American land session, uh, or explore every Native American land session during this period. And you can click on each one. You can enter specific peoples or places. But what I was actually attempting to link to was, that's not what I wanted to do, this uh, time lapse. So you start seeing them here in Ohio country. You see them carving out the state of Tennessee. Tecumseh is a young man during this period, coming of age. And you'll see the ones that we talked about. War of 1812 is about to happen. This will disappear. Fort Jackson Treaty, that disappears. Start chipping away, creating Oklahoma as an Indian reservation territory. Now we're about to get up to the Civil War where things will kind of go on pause, and then guess what? After the Civil War, they discover gold and silver in all this territory. Look at that, California, the 49ers. Gold discovered up, hill in the black, up here in the Black Hills. You gotta vanquish the Sioux and others, and then you turn your attention finally down here to the Apache, Geronimo, the last ones to hold out and to be put on these reservations, and then you'll even see the size of the reservations image. Which, interesting, there was a court case recently, a Supreme Court case, in which the court um, sided with one of, I think, the Creek Nation in Oklahoma and established that a large portion of the state of Oklahoma is actually a part of the Creek Nation, um, including, I think, the entire city of Tulsa and maybe parts of Oklahoma City, I can't remember, but... Uh, an interesting uh, contemporary relevance there. Questions? Anything? That's it. That's all we got. <laughs>